have some good questions. Um, after that, we're going to have a little bit of a break, and then I'm going to go in with can be risk assessment, um, and also talk about downsizing and downsizing the correct way. So, and then after that, we've got some more John Franco talking about um, leading angles. We got Chris Stubbs talking about um, video equipment. Um, do's and don'ts with the camera setups, when you should be flying a camera, etc. So we have a good day planned. Again, thank you all for, for being here. And Keith, it's your show, brother. Anybody got a question to start with? Okay. If you've got problems, tell us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one of the biggest issues I have is the low pass go arounds and the go arounds at altitude. Okay, and I have another one that's just a little, but anyway, it's very irritating to fly along for a mile while everybody's sitting in the back at 5,500 feet, and I'm going, okay, are we done, are we done, and I finally see somebody close the door. The go-around, the spotting lights are also used for a go-around. If you want a correction on the jump run, you hit whichever light in the direction you want to go. When we're done with a pass, or you want to go around, hit both lights. That tells me immediately that we're done. I can start climbing, I can start thinking about the next, the next pass. It saves time. I hate not knowing what's going on in the back of my airplane. And when I'm just flying along and there's only three people supposed to get out, I don't know if they got out or if they didn't. Everybody knows I have a mirror. That mirror was installed before they put benches in. All I see through that mirror is a bunch of heads and a bunch of people leaning forward to watch the jump. <laughs> okay? Um, I don't actually, I, and I can see the guy closing the door if I have to be looking at that point in time. But that mirror doesn't really work the way it was originally intended. Now, if we take the seats out, it's great. I can see the whole airplane, but I don't think we want to do that. So what do you want for signals as far as a go-around versus they're done? A go-around, and they're done basically at the low pass. It's a go-around. We're done with that pass, and we go up. Hit both lights at the same time, then I know that that pass is done for whatever reason. Yes. It is. It is a left and a right. You can help me give you a better jump run, and especially this time of year, when we have the big cumulus clouds, you have to remember the one place I cannot see is underneath us. Now there is. I. This is. This is my little thing. Um, obviously the most critical, I feel the most critical phase of the flight is the takeoff, okay? It's the one time that things can go horribly bad. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that affect the performance of the airplane. Having the door closed for, is safe for you and it also gives the airplane better performance on single engine. The one thing that does not affect the performance of the airplane is the fact that I left the jump light on and somebody's back there flicking it back and forth. <laughs> that absolutely tells me nothing and it is very, very irritating because until I get up to 1,500 feet, it's, I need to concentrate. And thankfully you guys can't always hear what I say because I tend to talk forward. <laughs> but I have made several comments. Um, so please, I know, you know, even if I didn't even, you guys didn't do anything, when I get the altitude, I'll look at it and go, oh, look. So I'll turn it back to red. One way or another, I'm not, you're not going to get out until you see the lights move. So that's why. A little bit of common right. sense on our part. If we're taking yeah. off and it's green, who cares if the lights are on? That's what, exactly what I see. Yeah. You know, once we get up and, and go on, you hit the lights, and it's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. I mean, I do this 20, 25 times a day. I tend to forget things. You know, I start down, I'm thinking about something else, I forget to turn the lights off. As we forget to use common sense. <laughs> so anyway, I know you guys got issues. You know, I'm not the nicest person I'm going around. <laughs> we wouldn't be here if we didn't have issues. There you go, that's true too. Um, you know, go-arounds, 
frequently, I mean, especially for the instructors, at some point, and when we're not busy, you might want to come up and say, you know, why we went around. Because sometimes I can't figure it out. We're directly over top of the drop zone. We're, you know, we're on our offset. We're basically in the center of the airport and I get a go around. It's like, why? Go arounds cost money. They're, the whole concept of being a jump pilot is to be efficient. I get irritated. I'm getting better, actually. <laughs> I'm getting better. Um, I came from a, you know, one airplane drop zone. I was a big fish in a small pond, even in the air. <clears throat> Out here, we are in the middle of the only place that I think might be as busy as us is Cross Keys. But we are extremely busy drop zone. <clears throat> we have worked really hard to create a positive relationship with ATC, and it's working well. And if there's something you guys want or want to know why I'm not doing it or I am doing it, you know, I may be flying all day, but I'm always done at the end of the day. And you can always catch me as I'm walking back and forth. So, you know, that's pretty much it. My job is not, you know, you guys have the fun in the back. My job is to make sure the airplanes are safe, the pilots are safe, and we get the job done efficiently for manifest. And a lot of that has to do with communication. So, anything else? Yes. Uh, I got a couple of things. One, like we're a community of signage. You know, there's signs everywhere. Like, do this. Don't forget to do that. Check the prop. What if we had a sign like explaining what the buttons mean? Because I've been there for 20 years. I had no idea that that one was right, one was left. And that's a, that's excellent. And I've then, actually thought about that myself. Sometimes I'm sitting in the front of the plane away from not near the door if I see everybody's done and I'm like right behind you is there something can I be like hey they're all done you know is that, is that going to be distracting to you uh, well it's not so much distracting one I can't hear you very much you thumbs up like I know but if you you need to look in my mirror sometimes all I see is and this thing the hand signals are supposed to be go around or you know we're done and all I see is a bunch of hands waving back and forth I can't distinguish it. The, the lights are there. There's almost always somebody close enough to the lights to use them, especially on the low passes, which is the really irritating part because um, we're wasting time and money and gas. As you guys notice, I tend to keep climbing on the go around on the low passes for that reason as much as anything else because I don't know when you're going to tell me. Yeah, so on that, for a lot of us as jumpers, you have your hop and pops, and a hop and pop will go out, and the person who's not jumping out tends to want to watch it for 15 yes. seconds. And I think, think that's a hop and pop. We think you're getting ready to jump out. Yes, exactly. When that person's done, if that's the end of the hop and pop, we need to signal that so we can keep climbing, because we do waste a lot of time waiting for you to enjoy the visual of his hop and pop before we all keep going to altitude. You can push those buttons yeah. That's and that's very true because I see the instructors who are usually back against the bulkhead. They're looking hard trying to figure out the yeah. same thing I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. And there's one guy hanging out there, and the last guy that got out was hanging out there watching the guy go. So you're thinking, you know who you are. <laughs> so I guess the question with that would be: Are we giving the all clear when we see that last hop and pops canopy yes. open? And that's oh, once he leaves the airplane, there's not a thing I can do about it. Once yeah. he leaves the airplane, yeah. That's a hop and hopper. He's done. Like, I think that's like, the reason for the delay is people don't know are they supposed to give the signal right away? Are they supposed to give the signal? Just the even if you want to watch, just hit the buttons yeah. and watch. As soon as I see the buttons come out, I've got an idea what's happening, but some guys can sneak out, bacon can. Bacon will be gone, and I didn't even know that the, the, the door was open, you know? And some guys exit hard, and I hear it, and I try to count, but I, I can't always count, you know? Um, actually, I feel it more in the airplane, in the airflow, yeah. So that would be a, a great thing. It would make my day a lot easier. It would make my day a lot happier. 
I pretty much actually are pretty much gotten the transition from the one airplane drop zone to the to this place, which I think is the greatest place I've ever worked, without a doubt. Um, you know, great people, lots of activity. Uh, the only thing I had to learn to do was turn a few more loads from where I came from, but I got that part figured out. Um, I've been doing this a real long time, longer than a lot of you guys are, unless you're over 40 years old. <laughs> um, and I enjoy it, and I'm pretty good at it. And I can, the more interaction I have with the people in the back, even during the jump, the better things can go. And I will always be happy to talk to somebody on a shutdown, when I'm walking back and forth. I know you guys see me. I'm walking past the fish pond with a swoop pond. <laughs> um, so I think we've got a great thing going here. It's one of the best places I've worked without a doubt, most enjoyable. Uh, safer airplanes, quality pilots, and great jumpers, you know? I have a question for you. Is there anything that we can do as far as weight and balance in the hover that would make life easier for you, whether it's on jump run in big ways or... Okay, yes. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, okay. Yes. Can I just add to that? And also include caravans in it. Oh, I caravan in March. Jump on the right wing. Uh -huh. So that's something to include. Is what the your yeah, well, well, actually, let, let me answer this question as an otter and then we, we can go into caravans. You know, everybody knows it's my favorite airplane. I wish we had caravans instead of otters. I, I'm being sarcastic. <clears throat> um, what happens, and this is this is a jumper phenomenon that has nothing to do with this drop zone. Um, my other airplane was a lot, had less power, which made it really, really irritating. But, so you guys, about 11, 11 five, everybody starts to do their thing, get their, you know, settle their gear down and stuff like that. At around 11, five to 12, you all start getting ready to jump, okay? What we do as jump pilots is we've, we're going to up a thousand feet a minute. So if I've got 2,000 feet, I need two minutes to get there, which is our goal, get there a mile before the spot, the exit, and let you guys out. Especially if it's a group, what you tend to do is everybody gets in the back of the airplane to get ready to jump. I call it jamming the tail. Because you feel put all the weight in the back of the tail, the airplane is what's going on and I go from a thousand feet a minute to 700 feet a minute which means you're only going to get 13.3 13.4 because I'm not going to go around for a couple hundred feet especially if, in my opinion you guys caused it when you shift the CG the weight to the back of the airplane it changes its attitude and it just can't, it's not designed to climb well that way so Stay on the benches when you can. Um, when we're when you see me settle up on jump run, you know, start moving back. But if you've got a 15 way, you don't need all 15 people in the spot behind the benches because what you're doing is you're costing yourself 400 feet of altitude. And again, I'm not going to go around for a couple hundred feet. So is it that they should wait before they get into that position? Yeah, wait till wait till. 12, 12, 5, get yourselves all ready. Wait till 12, 12, 5 when I level, when you see me, you know, feel the airplane level off on jump run, you can pretty much tell that, I'm sure. Then you can move back to the back because I'm situated, <clears throat> you're gaining nothing by being back there early and you're costing performance of the airplane, which is costing you, you know, I don't think 200 feet means that much, but everybody likes to get what they what they can get. That's the Scott Harper thing. So Mark Alcaz has on it is once the, the red light goes on, that's normally about a minute prior to yeah. the spot, correct me if I'm wrong, or really, yes. um, that'd yeah. be the time to start moving into position. Obviously at that point gear checks are done, everybody's ready to rip anyway. So just give it that time and we'll just have a minute here. I know for the big ways that's the practice, right? Red light. You know, red light, then you pack it up. Yeah. And once you pack it up, everything's <laughs> kind of set. 
you know, I'm set. When I turn the red light on, unless, you know, it's just one of those jump runs and I have them, everybody has them. I'm set for you to do your thing. I usually try and turn the red light on about a mile before the green light comes on because it's easy for me to figure out. And then you can, I mean, you still got that time to move. You feel the airplane settling in, you feel me bringing the props back, which is just a me thing. But um, then you're not really affecting the performance of the airplane because I'm bringing the power back, the props back, set, setting the airplane up for you to exit. Um, the other thing is, and I get a kick out of this, I'll be lining up on jump run, I'll be settling in, and you guys will start calling out ground speed. Ground speed 105! Well, yeah, I haven't slowed down yet. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Let me bring every, when you hear the props come back, then you know I'm at the, basically at the speed I'm going to be at when you exit. And all of a sudden it's, oh, ground speed 85. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I just kind of, I used to like, now I just laugh, you know. Um, and what you need to do is get those, those times are, are very safe times, and they are from exit to exit, not from exit to climb out because it takes you two to three seconds to climb out. So a five seconds between exit turns out to be eight seconds between exits. And these guys are going, get out of the airplane, get out of the airplane. They're a mile and a half past. So you're screwing them, you're not screwing me. You know, I keep flying until everybody's gone. So. To finish that question, what happens when the plane stalls? Does it what? When the planes yeah. Like, okay, like, okay, we'll switch to the caravan. In my opinion, the management loves the caravan. In my opinion, it is not a very good jump plane. Okay, it's not designed for jumping. There are several things about a caravan. <clears throat> for one thing, if you put all the weight in the back of the caravan, we try, we trying to get the airspeed down. When I was taught to fly the caravan, the, guy, the pilot was very conservative, but he taught me never to get below 100 miles an hour in the airplane. Well, you guys are going to be blown off the airplane. You can slow the airplane down. It doesn't have the, the wide center of gravity that the Otter does. Okay, So when you pack the tail of the, the caravan, if I don't anticipate it, it's going to stand on its tail. And at that point, the only thing I have left to go is full power, and they actually teach you, as a pilot, this is one of the problems I have, they teach you a save your life maneuver to kick you guys off the airplane. That's one of the reasons I don't think it's a great airplane. The, uh, the other thing is you can't do a big exit out of the, air, the caravan because you know where the tail is, everybody knows where the tail is, but what they don't think about is when they climb out and you got four, four or five people hanging out and the rest of the people getting in the door, the people hanging out just took half my tail off. They're blocking the wind from that tail. And there's a video that you, we saw, pilot's flying at 80, he probably should have been flying faster, but anyway, it took less than two seconds for the airplane to be in normal flight to flip over on its back and spiraling down. He was not a very experienced pilot, but that's what the airplane will do. You can't, you can't jam the tail. You can't, even if you're a fun jumper, you don't want to get big going out of the caravan. The tail is like right there. I mean, if you go out in a student arch, you're probably going to hit your head. If you go out as a wingsuiter, you could kill yourself and me too, which would really piss me off. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't. I signed up on this to, to provide a good service. Um, most of our wingsuiters, I have to say, are are very good about it, and I, I actually get kind of a kick out of it because the good wingsuiters getting out of a caravan, they just stuck up in a little ball, and I watch them tumble away till they get low enough to open their wings. Um, I had one guy that got out and he complained to Cam about barely missing the tail and that was only because he got the cam first. 
because I was going to complain to Cam about this guy inflating out the door of a caravan. And I watched him. Tail was here, and he went just like that. And if he had hit the tail, probably would have killed him. Good chance. I mean, it's the only... We wear a parachute in the caravan because it's that critical. And my next question is, how am I supposed to get from here? I can't go out the door. How am I supposed to get all the way back there? Supposedly pilots have done it, but I don't want to be one of them. I have a question. If the plane does stall as skydivers in the plane, depending on their position, how should they react to the situation? You're not going to react to the situation. You're going to so be bouncing. They're around. on the outside and it's stalled. It's going to go. Let go, and go. Just let go. If they're in the door as divers, they need to go. If if you're already on your way out the door, the chances are you can get out the door. If it stalls in that way, the 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 old old skydiver thing is, you know, I'll claw my way to the door. That doesn't happen. Nobody in completely inside the airplane has ever gotten out of a stall jump plane. They're along for the ride. Okay. That's why I do everything I can. The Otter is a beautiful, beautiful airplane. Um, it's, I've never stalled a jump plane and I have no intention of ever stalling a jump plane. And none of our pilots have stalled a jump plane. The caravan requires more work on everybody's part. You guys have a much bigger job to keep that airplane from stalling than you do in the Otter. You know the Otter, you can hang as many people as you want out of the airplane and just go with it. Uh, you cannot do that on the caravan. So so for a, uh, I guess, for the caravan specifically then, would there be an advantage to have a marker on the inside like you would have on the sky van? No, jump, no, no, no more than a certain amount of jumpers behind that line? Uh, you kind of do, I, I think. think. You do behind that, like where the hole would be in the Otter. For the caravan, it's the step. It generally says, yeah. nobody behind this. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody sits on this. Nobody yeah, well, that's, yeah, yeah. But even I'm thinking even forward. Well, the but it's, it's such a small space yeah. that, you know, it wouldn't be, it's not like a sky yeah. van where you've got this whole big yeah, thing, yeah. too. But that's the same concept. That's why they have that line. Yeah. There's a story about mm. a uh, Casa, good pilot. They took a big piece <clears throat> to the tail of the airplane. The airplane stood on its tail, flipped over on its back. Jerry Bird was stuck in one corner of the airplane as it spiraled down. One jumper got pulled out of the airplane and spent the ride on the belly of the airplane, watching the props turning, trying to figure out how to get off this thing. And it took him 8,000 feet for the pilot to turn it over. Once an airplane goes, it's not coming back, you know? Um, and if you're in the airplane, you're gonna be stuck somewhere and you are not going to be able to move, basically. So just think, don't stall. You know, don't jam up, especially on a caravan, don't jam up the tail. For the Otter, it costs you a little bit of altitude and a little bit of performance. For the caravan, it can be the difference between the airplane flying and the airplane spinning. So. It can be very simple, guys. If, I, if you have three groups in the plane, right, in a caravan, the first group's lining up to get out, they're, they're climbing out, the second group stays still. Once he leaves, they start moving. The third group doesn't have to move right away either. It can be just that simple. Just four people staying where they are. Just hesitate a couple of seconds. It helps the pilot out a bunch. Just that's, that easy. That's why you see yeah. the tandems usually stay on the bulkhead till it's time for them to go. That makes a huge difference. It doesn't seem like it would, but it makes a huge difference. I was flying the Canadians a couple of years ago, and they were the number two. I was a trail airplane. They had like a 12-way. So. They built their exit, so all 12 people, and then they walk their exit to the door. And what the airplane sees is all the weight I've got in the airplane just came into my tail. And it went like this, and it was not pretty. Um, because the airplane doesn't care if it's five people. Actually, with 20 people, it's better because you can't get them all jammed in the tail. They have to spread out a little bit. The weight balance is 100% better. But if you've got a small group and you're like Keith said, if you're not the guys actually getting out, stay on the benches. You can still get there and get out in, in no time at all. You know, and again, on the caravan, everything we talk about is more critical on the caravan. You got smaller number of people, but the concept's still the same. Five people in a caravan move, that's all the weight that the airplane has. It thinks it's whole cargo. 
And by the way, we're the only pilots who have to deal with shifting center of gravity because everybody else straps their weights down in the airplane. It doesn't move till the airplane lands. You guys, center of gravity changes every, every jump run. And if you think about that, and if you're, if you're, even if you're doing a solo, at least stay underneath the wing. Don't go all the way to the tail to watch a maxi. That makes a huge difference. The center of lift is the wing. So you're at least in the middle of the airplane's envelope, which is, you got a rear envelope where it stands on its tail. You got a forward envelope where it nose dives and you can't get it back up. And the wing is a mouth. So think about it that way. So, anything else? If we could go back to a couple of issues that I already brought up. One was uh, Vanessa was talking about go around and stuff like that. Uh -huh. I would say if you need to unintended or unplanned go around, definitely communicate that forward after hitting the button. And so like, yeah, there if was you, a plane, there was a cloud, whatever it was. Exactly, so because mm -hmm. for example, if there was a cloud, then I know on the go around, I'm gonna go around to my left so I can see, get a view of the jump run and go, okay, I see it. You know, I need to be over here. We, the other day we had, we literally flew two jump runs through a crack between the two, two, uh, two clouds. And it was head, thankfully it was heading eastbound, but I, it was the only place to go. And I literally just turned it, at, pointed it towards the crack and the guys in the back fine-tuned it to where they got out in blue sky. But you're absolutely right. Once you give me the go around, we got, it's gonna take time to do a go around. I don't do 180s because you use total, total concept of where the people that just got out are. Um, and then pass up, you know, it's clouds or, you know, it's clearer to the, and I call on the ground, I say, where do you see the holes? And they'll tell me, well, you, you know, if you move over a little bit more to the east, then you'll have clear skies. I guess another part of my uh, question would be for the staff, this young lady here was saying that she didn't know what the buttons did, but during the drop zone briefing, that when something started to come up with new jumpers, they're not obviously amongst ourselves trying to reiterate that. Yeah, and a little little placard right by the lights won't hurt at all. That's an excellent idea. I, I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, but we got people that can do that. Um, you know, because what somebody will do a lot of times is they'll push one button, or it's like. Does he want me to turn or does he want a, you know? And don't keep hitting the button. If you meet, want me to make a fairly radical turn, hold the button. Then I know that I'm continuing to turn. You know, you keep pushing the button, I have a sure fuse. It's like, oh, I want to turn, we'll turn. Button etiquette for go rounds versus um, we're done, we can go to altitude. I see a bunch of people they'll like press both buttons rapidly or would you rather it be held? Or does it, one mean one thing and one means another? No, I, I, two buttons means we're done with that pass, whether it's at five Flashing five. or holding still. Or, or if, if Cam likes to push both buttons. You, I get it, right you know, right it's right like, right. okay. Right. Yeah. Um, if we're at five five, those two buttons mean they're all out. We can continue okay. to climb and I can start setting up for the next jump run. If we're at altitude and I get those two buttons, that means go a go around. I'm not going to start descending. I'm not going to start doing anything. Um, you get three passes. If we can't figure it out by three passes, we're going down. You know, so don't be cavalier with the go arounds. You know, or we can go down sooner if everybody says, "Hey, you know, there's there's nothing doing here." But. You know, I'll give you three passes. We'll try to do whatever we can to get you out. And then we start going down. But you know, if you feel like just punching the buttons, that's fine as long as you hit both of them. That's what I see. And it's like, okay, we're going around. Then you can come back up and say, hey, we got clouds. Can we go a little bit more to the left or the right or <clears throat> whatever we need to do? <clears throat> or a lot of times I'll see that we can, like I said, just turn around on jump run and come the other way. Or on the way down, you'll we'll say we can get seven grand if you guys want to hop. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I will, I have no problem with putting you out underneath the clouds to a certain point. In the summertime, right. if it's raining, you know, we're not flying through the clouds. Yeah. He did that to me last year. 
It's like oh, you yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's raining, Kim. What was my five dollars? It's raining, Kim. Um, so yeah, the, but the big thing is both lights. One light or the other light means something. Both lights mean we're done with this procedure. Start the next. Anything else? What you just said with the both lights. Jump run to get ready. If you don't turn the lights on, that means you found out something in the cockpit, radios or whatnot. Hey, we're not jumping just yet. So you may communicate to somebody, you know, hey, we're holding it, or you're going to go around. Mm -hmm. so if there's no light, that means you found out something up yes. there. We don't know <coughs> what it is. It could be another plane in the area or yes. whatever. We don't see it, but you do, uh -huh. or the tower is communicating. Yes, the green light. The green light means <clears throat> we we work as pilots. We work hard on our spots. But what the green light light actually means is that I'm okay with you getting out. You know, a lot of times I'll turn the green light on a little early. If you know, and usually I will announce like, "Hey guys, I'm going to open the door." your spot and when I get you within as you're trying to figure out how you're gonna do this when I get you to where I'm pretty sure you can get back to the airport I'll turn the green light on and say it's on you so 90% uh, of the time the green light means we're at the predetermined exit point for the first group but yes if you don't see any lights don't get out of the airplane you, you, you know you could be jumping right into a thunderstorm and I have people on the ground have told me several times. I'm going, I think I can get it. And John called up one day and he said, bring that airplane down now. <laughs> and I said, okay, you know, <laughs> you're good, you know. One, one more question. Uh -huh. Early in the morning, since the group that I jumped on, you, you, uh, you would like for a person in our group to come over and say, hey, we're doing crew this morning. Let's get all the pilots together. Let's figure out, because one plane's not a big deal, but when we start flying two planes, then we can be in right. this airspace, which, you know, we know that's dangerous. So. Yeah, we, that, two planes is an issue. There's another other issue that has arisen. I spend a lot more time than I ever thought I would talking to the FAA once I got this job. I didn't talk to them for 20 years. I talked to them several times. We had an incident with the Qatar crew team, got out, the, in, the controllers assumed when you get out of the airplane, you go down, okay? They opened up and he cleared a biz jet through because he was trying to get this guy out. Uh, he's also the one that doesn't like us, but that's besides the point. But he cleared the biz jet through our airspace and he freaked out when he saw all the parachutes. So the deal we worked out, because I, I said to them, I said, okay, um, we always thought this airplane space was protected. He said, no, that's our airspace. You have a NOTAM, we communicate and they do not fly people through here when we are in the air. <clears throat> they were under the assumption that once you get out, you're, everybody's in free fall and they don't have to worry about you. So the agreement is that we tell, when you guys are gonna do a crew load, I need to know, or end of the day, high poles, I need to know that because as, I, as you get out, I tell the controller, I have five canopies in the airspace, they'll be there for eight minutes. So they will not put people through the airspace for eight minutes. As soon as they know our plane's on the ground and you guys want to look up, you're going to see people flying through. They use this airspace when we're not using it. And it is all, that whole situation got us actually a much better cooperation and relationship with ATC than we had before because we were both kind of hitting like this and somebody got scared and we said okay we have to work together make everybody safer so they now vector people around us if we're even in the air as soon as we take off they put our wall up around our our airport unless it's like guy going by a 10 grand 
you know, they'll let him go by. And, but once we get up to 10 grand, they keep the airspace clear. Now there are people that don't talk to anybody. So you still have to watch out for airplanes because you got little podunk Piper Cub and gliders mm -hmm. flying through. And they're not talking to ATC. They don't show up on ATC's radar. So they don't know they're there, okay? And if I can say one thing about the gliders, skydivers think this is our thing, this is our air. Glider pilots think the same thing, okay? The one thing that is incredible about this airport is the diversity. We've got so many different disciplines of aviation operating out of here. And we all have the legal right to do that. They have as much right to put their glider underneath the cloud on jump run as we have to jump through their airspace. So instead of getting mad, we have worked out a relationship with them. We tell them what our jump run is. They tell their glider pilots, and glider pilots being like skydivers, either think about it or they don't. <laughs> so, you know, put yourself in their space. They say, well, I'm jumping here, and they go, well, I'm circling underneath this cloud. <laughs> the best one I had was, I put bacon out underneath the cloud, and this guy flew underneath the cloud, and <laughs> bacon went by, and he mentioned it to me on the way down. And uh, this guy came back, he said, you couldn't, you couldn't jump. I'm underneath a cloud. And it's like, what do you think that is? A steel wall? <laughs> you know, come on, buddy. You know, it's just a cloud. And by the way, I was underneath the cloud. And they police their people too. There was a guy that kept hanging out right over the drop zone. And they basically told him he needed to find another place to go fly gliders. So we all want to work together. And I try and tell you guys they're going to do their thing, and I try and tell you guys when they're going to do something that is, one, not the norm, and two, is going to conflict with our landing area. But what you guys have to remember, according to the FARs, the Federal Aviation Regulations, no open parachute is allowed to cross an active runway below 800 feet. So think about that. And we all know that that happens every day. So we're gonna lose the legal battle if it comes to that. Besides skydivers lose all the time anyway. Airplane only, uh, AFA only kills about airplanes. So let's be nice, let's play nice. And they, they have the same philosophy, you know? And we've got a great relationship with ATC. We've got a great relationship with the gliders. Hell, the uh, general aviation pilots, they're worse than me about telling people not to overfly this airport. They'll jump right on the radio and say, do not overfly Zephyr Hills. There are parachutes in the air and this and that. And they're going, hey, thanks, man. <laughs> you know, I appreciate it. And they will circle. They will do all sorts of things because they know exactly what we're doing. We follow the same pattern. I tell them every mile or half mile where I'm at. And, you know, this is a great place. It's, it's where we can be free. Well, we're on that subject, we've noticed several police helicopters flying right through during jump ops. Are they less likely to talk to ATC or? They're pretty much do what they want. Okay. Um, and if they're below opening altitude, then it's on you guys to avoid them. Okay, they, police helicopters don't fly at 5,000 feet. You know, 3,000 feet is pretty much where everybody's supposed to be open. And that's what we base our timing for ATC <clears throat> is opening altitude. So if you're going to do a hop and pop, I don't tell them every time you do a hop and pop because it's a 5,000 feet. That's considered, you know, open canopy space. It's from 5,000 on up. And the same thing with gliders. Most gliders stay around 3,000 feet. Some of them will get higher. They can be very irritating and be right off the end of the runway from my point of view. But they, if you see them, if you're under an open canopy, you can avoid them better than they can avoid you because they are so focused on their, their IBSI, their rate of climb, their lift, that I can blow by, right by one of those guys and he doesn't even wag his wings. He never saw me. And I'm going, <laughs> um, So that becomes our responsibility, pretty much. Um, don't land on the runway, don't. 
don't swoop over the runway because if you get down to a certain point over the runway, there's going to be airplanes there. <clears throat> they give us this runway, but they have every right to take off and land on it if they want to. That's a pure cooperation thing. So, and it's going to get interesting when they finally open this up. There are going to be a bunch of pilots that come out there and go, oh man, I'm going to land on the new runway. So it's kind of like people driving on the new stretch of road. They're going to all come down and land on it and take off on it. But our relationship with the general aviation people is excellent too. You know? And management works hard for this relationship. So, anything else? Uh, just going back to the hop and pop, you were mentioning that you don't necessarily always announce to APC or make an announcement that a hop and pop's getting out. Would you say it's more critical for those of us? That oh, no, know? I do. Okay. I do tell them. I tell them, I give them a two minute call. It may not exactly be two minutes, but I tell them anytime somebody's getting out of the airplane. Um, and if we're doing go arounds, you know, it's a hop and pop load, I will tell them multiple passes. That, you know, so that we're not gonna see us climb, but gonna, we're gonna be down there for a while. Some of them will say, you know, I want a two minute call on every pass, which is kind of ridiculous because it takes about two minutes to bring it around. But no, I tell them every time. And I also tell uh, Unicom, the pilots here, that there's gonna be a hop and pop. And at altitude. Yep, every time. I'm required to do that. We have a letter of agreement. And it's been reassessed and to the more positive, actually. We have a better relationship right now than we had with them last year. By, I think by a wide margin. You had something? To go back to the, when you guys were talking about crew, so the whole push, and I don't know if you could speak to this or Cam, but the whole push to have now a high pull being only on last load of the day goes back to kind of that situation that happened with Qatar and, and yes, it's to all cooperate about, with airspace is yeah. the reason for that last load of the day only, just so that everybody understands more why that direction came down. That's pretty much what it's about. Um, and until that situation arose, people were doing high pulls without telling me or without telling people on the ground. It can be dealt with better um, if, if I know about it. The last thing we need now, because this is a sore point, and we, we, we had several phone calls with the supervisor at, at uh, Tampa, if we get caught not telling them for whatever reason, they're gonna be really mad, you know, because pilots freak out when they see a parachute. You know, they don't think about us, they don't, and they never, a jet pilot would never think to see 20 canopies go by, or him feeling like he's gonna bust through 20 canopies. So, it's easy, it's more easily managed if we do, Everybody does their high pulls at the end of the day. It's not a, you know, you're gonna get kicked off the drop zone rule. It's going to be, it will elevate to that level if you don't tell anybody that you're doing it. Okay, 5,000 feet should be the top. 5,000 tandems, occasionally 7,000, but that should be where you start opening your parachute. I think that will agree with USBA and everybody else. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much, you don't want to be, because remember, there's a lot of pilots out there that don't talk to anybody, and they're just going to come flying along. So, um, that is something where we've tried to work out to be fair to everybody, so to speak. The crew people, I have to know anytime they're on the airplane. You know, and Cam has worked out with the crew people to work out jump runs and exit points that will not interfere because we've had situations where two guys get out they and I've got tandem still on the airplane they open up we have to do a ground round and I can't let anybody else out of the airplane because I don't know where they are and I have to wait till they get to the ground before we can put somebody else out of the airplane and that's what brought that to our <clears throat> attention and the the guitar is just kind of the icing I can on the cake. Speak table. on that in a little more detail. Um, a day like today, doing crew, crew dogs like to get out. 
you know, mile and a half prior, two miles prior, depending on what the wings are doing. It makes it easier for them because they can open up and just fly directly up jump run or up line of flight. And they don't have to turn, which makes the builds easier for them, etc. So it makes the skydive easier. Um, so a day like yesterday, we didn't have any clouds except for that high layer. All day long, I'm like, yeah, go get out two miles prior, no issues. If we have to do a go around, we'll have eyes on you from the time you open until we can release you or we can offset the jump run accordingly, depending on the position. Days like today, when we have clouds from 3,000 feet to 8,000 feet, if we have people getting out 12 grand a mile and a half prior and deploying out the door, and we need to go do a go around, obviously nobody from the airplane is gonna be able to spot them. The ground crew can't see them. And now we're up there circling, waiting. So that's the only time I try to encourage the crew to get out behind the, uh, the rest of the jumpers for that reason. So it's safer for them, it's more efficient for the drop zone, and everybody gets to play nice. So that's the reason why we try to, try to do that in the different days. So it's a little more detail. Okay. And the only other thing is, I'll say it, I'll be, I'll be the bad person that brings this up. Um, so we're on a weather hold. You hear all of us jumpers on the deck going, God damn it, why the hell are we on another weather hole? The, the sky is clear. We see a hole. Why aren't we in the sky? Because I don't we have We all understand doctor. that you have your license and you don't want to get into trouble, but can you help us better understand besides the fact that there's FAA regulations, could you maybe talk a little bit about how we need to be thinking that's what's going on in your mind so that we are okay. sitting on the deck not getting frustrated going like, Come on, let's get in the that air, let's get in the air. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. I understand that. That's one of the reasons I hide in the hangar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my flippant remark is that I don't have a helicopter. Okay, I can't go straight up through this hole. Look around. I have to climb, and I'm not allowed to climb through clouds or descend through clouds. The other thing governing factor is you guys you know we have AWOS which is the two minute what people call it the two minute weather on the on the telephone call it up we are not when they call for broken clouds broken clouds technically means eight tenths of the sky covered okay now it may be eight tenths here and a great big hole here but when they call for broken clouds we are not legally allowed to go up Okay, if we do and something happens, the first thing they're going to do is check the AWOS, say there are broken clouds, you guys are busted, you shouldn't have been in the air to begin with. And a lot of it is we're looking at, you know, we've got, for a normal jump, we've got a 35 minute time lag from what you're seeing right now. 20 minutes call, 15 minutes to get to altitude. Okay, so look on the horizon and you will see clouds building up, especially on a day like today when they're going 40 knots. By the time we get to altitude, I've got a whole different sky. And we work on that with manifest by saying, okay, let's do a 15 minute call, or sometimes even a 10 minute call. Um, but we have to err on the side of caution, and there's plenty of people, cam, instructors, that will come say, hey, have you looked at the sky lately? Okay, and I'll go out and, and I, I keep an eye on it and I try to do the best I can, but some days it's as frustrating for me as for anybody else because that end of the airport will be clear. This end of the airport will be clear and we'll have a lot, row of clouds coming right over top of the drop zone. So I can't dump you. The other thing is a lot of times when you look at the blue, that blue is really two miles away. Because I've gone up there and checked it out, and it's like, okay, we're over the green swamp. I can't put you guys out here. Although, we have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but one of the first things TK said to me, I was gonna do a late jump. He said, have you ever gone to look for somebody in the green swamp in the dark? I said, no. He said, that's why we're not going up. <laughs> that is a incredible big place with lots of nasty things in it. And, but I know it's frustrating sometimes and sometimes I get it wrong. Sometimes I misjudge. Sometimes I see a deck of clouds coming and I'm going, okay, we can't go. And then they dissipate and it's like, you know, nobody's perfect. We can work together on this. You guys know where I am, okay? 
you know, I'll find a new place to hide if too many people come. Hands off limits, guys, sorry. If you've got a question about what's going on, just come and ask me. You know, you stay on your side of the, that little fence, and I'll stay on my side of that little fence, and, and we'll get along fine. Uh, but one thing you can do is check the AWOS on the telephone. If it says broken clouds, then I have to be more careful. I've got, <clears throat> I developed a phrase a long time ago, I have to give my lawyer something to work with. So if it's broken clouds and it actually is broken sky, my lawyer's got nothing to work with. And I just paid him $2,000 and I still get busted. If there are days when they're calling it broken skies, but it's in such a way that we can continue to jump. And we don't shut down unless we have to. And, you know, you guys want to jump all the time. And we need to do it safely and legally. It's not just my ticket. <clears throat> this whole operation will come underneath the microphone. And the jumping we do do on the edge will have to stop. Because they can sit out there and just wait, you know. And somebody's going to punch a cloud. Some guy do it deliberately. So, you know, I know that's one of the more frustrating things about skydiving. And the gliders can go up and everybody can go up. But... <clears throat> we have different parameters. So that's, that's my answer to that one. Anybody else? Great okay. job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, guys, you guys just got a, a small little inkling of what Keith does for us on a daily basis. From ATC to dealing with us grumpy skydivers to all the daily situations that arise with weather, he does an amazing job keeping us all safe on a daily basis. So um, I just wanted to award him with this year's Chess Judy Safety Award that's given out annually to people that go above and beyond in the name of safety. Wow. And this year it's to our chief pilot, Keith.